right now. A San Antonio high school senior facing brain cancer now taking a moment to feel like a teen again. The ceremony for one girl coming up and their lives are placed in the hands of human smugglers. New video tonight showing the dangers some of their victims face. Plus another fire flares up at a west side apartment complex. What firefighters found during their second visit there and what we're hearing from one of the victims. But first. Growing concerns surrounding a COVID-19 variant from overseas. It's already been found in one part of the U.S. The night team's Tiffany Huertas tells us San Antonio is now monitoring for that variant, and she speaks with a contact tracer. I think somewhere it said it's a double variant. It just means that there was changes in multiple portions of the genetic makeup, which happens all the time with, with viruses. So Rita Espinoza, the chief of epidemiology at the city of San Antonio, is talking about the coronavirus variant from India and most recently discovered in California. Here at home, still no case of the new double variant, but people are monitoring for any changes. As far as the genotyping and the sequencing that's being done randomly on some samples, that's how we would identify those uh, individuals as that testing and surveillance is occurring on those specimens to do the sequencing to see the genetic makeup of the virus to see if it's mutated. Espinoza says contact tracing continues to be one of the strongest tools in the fight against the spread of COVID-19. There's always work to be done. San Antonio resident Belinda Maynor is one of about 175 contact tracers in San Antonio. It's a roller coaster and it seems like every time there's there's a little holiday spring break or Easter now we're expecting more cases because of the gathering. Maynor says while there are more people getting vaccinated, many are letting their guard down. They're under the assumption that if I've had it or I've received both of my vaccines, I'm good. I'm I'm clear. And you're not. So you still have to follow guidelines. Espinosa says vaccines don't necessarily prevent COVID cases, but will keep people out of the hospital. She also confirmed two people did get COVID after they were fully vaccinated, but none of those cases are severe. Now, vaccinations continue here at the Alamo Dome. Tomorrow afternoon, people 75 and older can get the vaccine without an appointment. Tim. Tiffany Huertas reporting live for us tonight. Thank you. Let's take a look at where we stand with coronavirus cases here in Bear County. 275 new cases reported today. No new deaths were reported. Meanwhile, in our hospitals, 179 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized tonight. 72 are in intensive care units and 30 are on ventilators. One COVID-19 patient caught the virus before vaccines were available. She says she was not hospitalized, but nine months later, she is still suffering debilitating stroke-like symptoms. Chrissy McCafferty Gibson's COVID symptoms started on June 12th. After two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks, she felt better, but just for a few short days. And then the neuro neuro symptoms started. I was using a walker and not being able to to speak or use both sides of my face. And all along, this headache was like still the most intense headache I've ever had in my life. Gibson's husband thought she may have had a stroke, but turns out all those tests came back clean. She eventually found the COVID long hauler clinics at University Health and UT Health San Antonio. Most of their patients had COVID, but were never hospitalized. To an IFEED update now on a deadly shooting near a gas station tonight. A first look at the woman accused of shooting and killing a 50 year old man. That is Miranda Garcia. She is facing a murder charge tonight. Police say her arrest came after they found the victim in the parking lot of a Valero gas station on San Pedro last night. He later died at the hospital, but an identity so far has not been made public. Another fire sparking up hours after the first and now arson investigators are taking a closer look at more clues. Firefighters were first called to some west side apartments on Westward just before noon today. About 12 units were damaged near Highway 90 and West Military. Firefighters were then called back to that area again around 5 p.m. A maintenance man says he was boarding up windows when he noticed flames in one of the units. Firefighters put out the flames and found six containers that will now be looked at by arson investigators. Residents are left wondering if they'll ever be allowed to go back into their homes. It's just been such a tragedy. I mean, I've worked so hard for the little that I have. It's not much, but it was mine, and it's all gone, and I just don't know what we're going to do. 
No one was injured in either fire. The Red Cross now helping those victims who were displaced. San Antonio's FBI office sharing a case in hopes of helping catch a suspect called the Bank Bomb Bandit. This case is out of Weimar, Texas, about 110 miles east of San Antonio. Take a look. Investigators say a man went to the Hill Bank and Trust Company on Main Street back on March 30th. He's then accused of demanding money from the teller and threatening to set off a bomb. The suspect last seen driving a light gray or silver colored sedan. Bank surveillance photos of the suspect were released. If you know who that man is in the photos, call 713-222-TIPS. You may be eligible for a $1,000 reward. What do you expect from the San Antonio Police Department? That's what city officials hope to get answered in a series of community meetings. Today's meeting kicked off the series and focused on District 10, but Councilman Clayton Perry not exactly impressed with the turnout of participants. We need more participation in this, and I, I think this is a problem that we're going to see across the city, and, and we need to kind of figure that out on, you know, are we going to policy based on 40 people in District 10? You can weigh in on the expectations of SAPD each meeting taking place online and we'll focus on another area of the city each meeting. We have a full schedule available right now at KSAT.com. The next one takes place on Thursday. That'll be for District 2 and it starts at 6 p.m. The Minneapolis police chief who fired Derek Chauvin calling the death of George Floyd murder. This after taking the stand, kicking off day one in week two of testimony in Chauvin's trial. ABC's Andrea Fujia reports. As the Derek Chauvin murder trial enters its second week, the jury heard testimony from the Minneapolis police chief in charge at the time of George Floyd's death. He testified that Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck was not a trained department tactic and went on for too long. To continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that, that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, it is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. The defense arguing body camera video shows Chauvin's knee was not on Floyd's neck, but his shoulder blade right before paramedics put him on a stretcher. The chief agreed, but said it wasn't clear if Floyd was alive at that point. He also acknowledged the defense's assertion that neck restraints were allowed under department policy the day Floyd died, but added it shouldn't have happened. I vehemently disagree that that was the appropriate use of force for that situation okay. on May 25th. Chauvin faces manslaughter, second degree murder and third degree murder charges in George Floyd's death. Video appears to show the former officer kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine and a half minutes. Chauvin has pled not guilty to all of the charges. The trial is expected to last another two to three weeks. Andrea Fuji, ABC News, New York. Bit breezy outside right now. You notice that southeasterly wind, which is going to boost that humidity overnight and temperatures for the most part right around the 70 degree mark, give or take a little bit. Tomorrow morning, waking up to cloudy sky, a bit of humidity in the air. You'll notice a bit of mugginess and 64 degrees, but get ready for temperatures to spike later this week. I mean, we're talking the hottest weather that we've had in about 23 weeks. I'll tell you more about it coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Four minutes and 37 seconds. That's just how close Texas was from a catastrophic grid failure during February's winter storm. While we narrowly avoided that situation, the storm was still devastating. And there have been a lot of questions about why the state's power grid was so vulnerable in the first place. It is a topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. We will live stream KSAT Explains the Texas power grid failure tomorrow at 7 p.m. on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app, on streaming devices, and on our Facebook page at KSAT 12. Still ahead on the night beat, human smugglers caught on camera the dangerous journey that played out near San Antonio coming up. And a night beat update on a San Antonio girl whose story has now gone viral. The special ceremony created for Heaven Sanchez next on the night beat. Give her a round of applause. 
Now to a night beat update on Heaven Sanchez, who marked a major milestone with a special graduation celebration. We first introduced you to Heaven last week. She was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer at just five years old. Later, the high school senior and her family are embracing all of life's moments. The constable's office organizing a special graduation at Gustafson Stadium and the Precinct 2 constable's office made her an honorary deputy constable. Heaven's story being shared on social media and you can follow her story right now on KSAT.com. They can be ruthless. Just last week, we saw suspected human smugglers tossing toddlers over the border fence. Tonight, another example of the dangers as human smugglers caught on camera pushing people from their vehicles at high speeds. It's all taking place just west of Bear County. The night team's Patty Santos spoke with a Dimmick County constable whose dash cam captured these stunning images. You see an individual actually shove a couple of these individuals out the door and finally hit the ground on the highway. Dimmick County Precinct 3 Constable Robert Baldera says he saw nine men get pushed out of a moving SUV during this chase in March. They slowed down to about 55 miles an hour and pushed the individuals out and then continued. Even down to the very last effort where they crashed to the fence, they pushed the, one of the passengers out and he violently tumbled, nearly striking the barbed wire fence. The chase lasted about 15 minutes and traveled about 20 miles from Big Wheels to Delhi. I've never seen that. That That's one of the, the wildest, scariest chases I've been in. But then I says chases involving suspected human smugglers have become common in recent months. In this stop, eight men bailed out of the truck. Two more were found hiding inside. Every day between 10 to 12 times a day, Maybe more because I've lost count, to be honest with you. And this is going on through a 24 hour period. Law enforcement in other nearby towns and counties seeing similar problems with it escalating to dangerous and sometimes deadly high speed chases. In this chase, the driver got away, but two suspected migrants were detained. One of them had minor injuries. The way they hit that pavement was very violent. It was concerning and scary. Paleta says despite help from DPS, they still can't keep up. He says oftentimes they'll be on a call, they'll see a vehicle driving by, they know is involved in human smuggling, but they're tied up. They want state and federal authorities to see what they're dealing with so they can send help. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. A disturbing story. Even more disturbing, social media may be helping human smugglers coordinate their efforts. Investigators say they advertise safe passage to the U.S. in quick reunification with loved ones once they arrive here. It is a problem now catching the attention of a House committee trying to combat disinformation. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg was questioned by lawmakers about that issue. Zuckerberg saying they have policies in place and are working to fight the content. Meanwhile, our coverage continues online. Just log on to ksat.com slash border for a look at updates as they happen. Meanwhile, back here at home, taking a live look outside. Not too bad out there today, Adam, but it is about to get warm here in San Antonio. Warm, hot, however you want to put it. Uh, we're going to feel the heat compared to what we've had for a while. And this could be some of the hottest weather that we've had since last October. So we're talking about 20 three weeks or so since we've seen this kind of heat. So we're going to be cranking it up a bit later this week. Gradually, we're going to make it to our peak by Thursday, Friday, and there is the chance of some storms late in the week. So we'll get around to that as well. But let's start with temperatures. Take a look at where we are and where we're going to go. Today we started off at 59. We topped out at 81, both just a little above average for this time of year. We're going to be well above average. And later on this week, probably not quite record breaking territory, but much warmer. Take a look at the readings right now. And what's interesting here and the reason I'm showing this is actually farther to the north of us. It's warmer than it is here in South Texas. Omaha, Minneapolis all have us beat in the low to mid 70s at this hour. There's this little nose of warm air that just skirted our area and pushed northward up the plains. They're feeling actually warmer temperatures up there than what we had down here for today. Okay, we're going to gain some ground here pretty quickly. Kerrville's at 68, a comfortable 69 in New Braunfels and 64 in Rock Springs. 
south of the escarpment, we're mostly in the lower 70s. Let's go to tomorrow morning. We'll wake up to readings in the low to mid 60s, near 60 in parts of the hill country, mid 60s for pretty much the rest of us. Then by the afternoon, we get above 90 degrees along the Rio Grande. But here in San Antonio, it'll be in the mid 80s. So 85 for the high temperature tomorrow. Gonzales about 83, Helotus 85, Seguin 85, Lavernia, Elmendorf 86, 87. So today we were near 80, tomorrow mid 80s. Look at this, Wednesday back to 90 degrees. That'll be the first 90 degree reading since October 22nd. And then Thursday and Friday, right now it looks like we're on track to be in the mid 90s for afternoon high temperatures. The records Thursday and Friday are 99 to 98. So I think we'll be just shy of them, but obviously still well above average for this time of year. You know, we got lucky with a few little showers out there. Goliad to DeWitt County, right in Quero, in and around Quero as well. Got hit by a few brief showers earlier today. That was all closer to the Gulf Coast line. And this little ripple here in the upper level flow helped to kickstart some of those, but we're not looking at any big, broad disturbances dropping into Texas anytime soon. So unfortunately, the drought that we're in is gonna stay in place and we don't see any drought rain within the foreseeable future. There is a disturbance. This dip in the upper level flow this is what we look for. We like to see them dropping down into northern Mexico to give us some good lift, but it's going to stay far to the north of us and just basically move due east and really not have a direct impact on our weather. So dry for the most part, but notice we do have a slight storm chance as we get into Friday, Friday afternoon, Friday evening. We could see a few pop up thunderstorms and the trick with these is that if we do actually see a few storms develop, I think there's a shot at them becoming strong to severe. So that's something we'll be really watching closely Friday evening through Friday night. A little bit of fog tomorrow morning, so some dampness and of course you'll notice humidity in the air, but it's just going to reduce visibility nuisance in a few spots. We don't expect anything too widespread, but for the morning commute 730 AM visibility could be down to a few miles out there. Just something to keep in the back of your mind, but shouldn't be uh, overly problematic. So mainly low clouds in the morning, bit humid 64, 85 by the afternoon. You go to the Rio Grande, though, we'll be into the low 90s. We'll have a lot of sunshine and breezy, though. You're going to notice that wind tomorrow out of the southeast at 15 to 25, and I think gusting up to 30 at times. There are those temperatures creeping upward mid 90s by Thursday and Friday into the weekend. We trim it back a little bit, dropping back down into the well, basically mid to upper 80s at that point, Tim. Thank you, Adam. Greg, the Spurs really unable to take advantage of a very long homestand. Yeah, nine games. They go two and seven tonight. Pop after this game tonight. Very brutally honest about his team and where they are right now. When we come back home is not where the heart is when it comes to the Spurs. And we've got a pack house for the Rangers home opener tonight coming up. Spurs looking to end their historic nine-game homestand on a high note, their third win hosting the Cleveland Cavaliers, but without DeJounte Murray, was a late scratch due to soreness in his right foot. San Antonio does get off to a solid start. DeMar DeRozan finds Jakob Pertl in the paint and spins for the lay-in, 17-9 Spurs. The Cavs answer back. Torian Prince out of Warren High School drains the corner three. He got 10 first half points, and Cleveland leads 28-26 after one. Second quarter, Keldon Johnson keeps the Spurs in it with this vicious slam. San Antonio down by four, then DeRozan muscles his way to the basket for the lay in two of his 13 first half points but the Spurs head into halftime trailing 57 47 third quarter Spurs trying to get something going Lucas Samanich drives hard at the basket gets it to fall Spurs down by 12 a little later Rudy Gay knocks down a three ball from the wing but Cleveland finds some separation thanks to Colin Sexton who scores 10 points in the third quarter alone San Antonio trails 100 to 80 after three the young guns get some playing time tonight Trey Jones comes up with a steal takes it the other way for the lay in another attempt to inject some life into the team, but no dice. San Antonio shoots just 42% from the floor. They lose their final game of this homestand, 125 to 101. Pop brutally honest about where his team stands after this game. We look like we're fried. You know, we just look tired. Uh, cup is, you know, less than half filled, it seems. You know, the fact is nobody's going to feel sorry for us, and those can't be used as excuses, but I think that's all part of what we're seeing because we don't look that, you know, energetic. 
Now they head out to another brutal road trip, five games in seven days, starting with back-to-backs against Denver on Wednesday, then it's back-to-backs against Dallas on Sunday and Monday, and they wrap it up all the way to Toronto on Wednesday, April the 14th. The North Carolina Tar Heels have decided to stay within the family and finding a replacement for Hall of Fame coach Roy Williams, who announced his retirement last week. Longtime assistant coach Hubert Davis has been named as his replacement. Davis has been assistant under Williams for the past nine seasons, was considered one of the favorites when Williams made his announcement. Williams won three national championships in more than 900 games in 33 seasons. The head coach in two of the most storied programs, Kansas and most recently, North Carolina. Davis played for Dean Smith from 1988 to 1992 before he was a first-round draft pick by the New York Knicks. And the NCAA men's tournament tonight, Baylor looks like it's just seconds away from their first-ever national championship. Looks like Gonzaga left it all on the floor against UCLA. That's right now, again, less than a minute to play, 86-67. Congratulations to the Stanford Cardinal who won their national championship here in San Antonio for holding off upset minded Arizona 54 to 53 in the finals of the NCAA women's tournament in the Alamo Dome. It was the first time that Stanford had won that title since 1992. What made it even sweeter for San Antonio fans is that the team includes Kiana Williams, who graduated from Wagner High School. She got to win it in front of her family and friends in a game that came down to the last shot. Six seconds to go. Arizona with a chance to win it at the buzzer. The Cardinal triple teams, Ari McDonald, and she can get a good shot off and Stanford survives. Never doubted this team for, for one minute. Um, you know, Tar kept telling us uh, uh, after every practice, you know, in the in locker room and in between games and stuff that we're the best team here and we just have to go out there and prove it. Um, I feel like we were ranked number one for a reason, but also rankings don't matter. Um, the entire tournament was in one location, so no one really had an advantage. Although, you know, this is my hometown, so I feel like we were the home team. Um, but, you know, we just have to go out there and, and give it our all and fight. Um, these, these last three, three games, they were dog fights, and we just came out on top because we, we wanted it more. Hey, immediately after the interview, Kiana and her Stanford teammates hopped on a barge at the convention center, celebrated like every other national championship would do in the Alamo City with a ride on the San Antonio River that was lying with family and friends on the world-famous River Walk. Congratulations again, Stanford. Congratulations to Baylor. They just wrapped it up 86-70 in the national championship. A new lawsuit filed against Deshaun Watson. Next. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Another lawsuit has been filed against Deshaun Watson of the Houston Texans that alleges the star quarterback exposed himself and grabbed her and claims a massage therapist was told she would have to sign a non-disclosure agreement in order to be paid. The lawsuit was filed Friday night, now becomes the 22nd overall lawsuit that Watson faces since March the 16th. Attorney Tony Busby, who represents the women in the 22 lawsuit, says he will hold a news conference tomorrow where he will address important and significant developments in the Deshaun Watson case. 40,000 people were on hand at Globe Life Field this afternoon for the 50th home opener in Rangers history. This is actually the first time fans have even been allowed in to attend a Rangers home game in their new stadium. Last year, every home game was held without fans in attendance. And even though they did host the World Series, the largest crowd last October was only 12,000. The atmosphere was electric, but the home team did not perform well. Top of the second, one on Marcus Simeon sends a two-run homer to left. Blue Jays score the first four runs of the game to take a 4-0 lead. Rangers finally get on the board in the bottom of the fourth courtesy of this RBI single from Nathan Lowe, but they fall sadly 6-2. to two. Getting back to Baylor, not only is this their first national championship in the victory over Gonzaga, 86-70, to 70, but it's also their first ever victory ever over Gonzaga. So congratulations to the Bears. Sikkim Bears. <laughs> Congrats. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> you got it. We'll be right back. Finally tonight, check this out. Gorillas at Berlin Zoo enjoying some Easter treats. Colored eggs served in a basket of salad leaves. Dad Sango here tried to take all the eggs for himself, but that didn't quite work out so well, and he only managed to collect about half those eggs before they rolled away. Each gorilla had a different approach to the eggs. One stuffed them in his mouth whole, spitting out the shells. Another carefully peeling them with her lips, and a third carefully removed the shells using her fingers. The new baby... Happy just to look on and enjoy the scene and take a nap. Now that's something you could study right there, the yeah. different reactions and how they all ate the eggs differently. Dad says, give them all to me. <laughs> I'm taking these. Mom's like, uh-uh, not so fast. We've all been there, right? Yep. All right, mid-80s tomorrow, 90 by Wednesday, mid-90s Thursday, Friday. Friday is our only shot at a few storms. All right, that's it for the night beat. Don't forget, good morning, San Antonio starts tomorrow, bright and early at 4.30. Have a good night.